Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and I'm still out on the West Coast. I'm in uh, California. I'm in my old... Unbelievable. I hit the wrong button. I'm in my old stomping grounds, uh, where actually where I used to live for, oh, I don't know, somewhere around eight or nine years. And I'm in Tiburon, uh, California, which is uh, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, a beautiful place, exploring uh, old places I used to go and, and having a wonderful time and uh, meeting up with some old friends. Uh, tomorrow, I'm meeting with my good friend, Dane, Dean Alioto, who uh, eventually he'll be on the show talking about a great uh, docu-series that he has coming out. Um, I've, I have seen enough of it to tell you it's going to be fantastic. So meeting with uh, Dean um, tomorrow, heading back east, and then in uh, November 5th, heading out to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to go to the MUFON boot camp, investigator boot camp. And I'm going to be filming. We're going to be doing a show from there as well. So podcast UFO on the road. That's what I am doing. So the blog this week is called a UFO photographed in the Italian Alp Alps. And that is uh, back in 1952. And I do believe the bottom line, uh, it's a very interesting um, hoaxed image. Uh, check out that blog by Charles Lear. Great, great uh, material as always. My guest this evening, Alfred uh, Kiros. And I think I have to, talked about this a, a number of times, but if you're new or just started listening to the show, um, I had an insurance broker many years ago. I want to say it was um, about mid-1990s. And we were discussing, we were done doing our business for an insurance policy. And he was walking around the house. We were just discussing different things. And he said, I had an interesting um, I forget what he said, an interesting position in the military during the Vietnam War. And so I said, well, ex well, what did you do exactly? And he said, I was on part of a team on the Air Force investigating UFOs during the war. And uh, at that time, of course, I didn't have the show. And I, I knew a little bit about maybe one or two UFO sightings, but I didn't really know too much about UFOs in general. Not that I know anything now, but uh, anyway, uh, so I asked him more and more about it. And, and uh, it was a real, it was a fascinating conversation. And I had the question that everyone seems to have, and that is, what are they doing? What are they doing here? If you think they're really here, the question I did ask him is, what does the government think they are? And his answer was, we are a Petri dish. And I thought that was uh, a fascinating answer. And I thought about it for a long time, you know, uh, years later. And when I started doing the show, I tried to look him up. I remember his, his name was Tom Bowden. And he was in New Hampshire, I believe. And I've tried to find him because I'd love to have him back on the show and I've never been able to find out anything on the internet, whatever happened to him. But our guest this evening is going to be talking about encounters during the Vietnam war. And I'm really excited to talk to him about it. It's the first time that uh, he is in a public venue speaking about this. And thanks to kind of uh, the ridicule factor kind of dissipating in the UFO topic, um, he was willing to speak about it. And he's a professor emeritus of art. And uh, here he is. Alfred, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be on you, Martin. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, I want to say thank you to the person that connected us. And right now, it's escaping my mind. Robert so, Frasconi. I, who was it? Robert Frasconi. He was the field investigator who was investigating a photograph I had taken in April of this year. Oh, well, we're definitely going to be talking about that, too. So thank you, Robert, so much for uh, connecting us together. And so let's let's hear um, now when we were talking off air, you mentioned that it was uh, you didn't even like to admit that you were involved in the Vietnam War because of the stigma. You know, you all came back from Vietnam and, you know, you were in the San Francisco, where I am right now, basically in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you had to keep it very quiet. Yeah. Well, there was a period of time where there was a, a large anti-war uh, protest going on during, during sure. the war. I uh, got out of the service in 1967, 
and went right into art school and yeah. uh, San Francisco Art Institute to, uh, to study painting. And um, you, you didn't bring it up. Uh, if, if you wanted to date young ladies, you did not mention the fact that you were a veteran. Uh, so for, for a while there, I used to have a lie and just tell people, the people would ask, because I was a little bit older than the rest of the freshmen. And they would ask me, uh, what are you, where were you? What, do you been, what, what did you do before school? And so I would tell them that I was studying at the University of Southern Nevada, US of N. Hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. if, and if they were from the West Coast and they knew universities, then I would say I was in Southern Nebraska. I was studying <laughs> oceanography. <laughs> that was the joke yeah. I had. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I not I didn't mention it very very often that I was a veteran. I, I probably about 1985 I finally came out and asserted the fact that I was a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know if you want to jump right into but well I guess before we jump right into the topic, I mean into your encounters, um, I want to ask you: Did you ever pay attention to the UFO topic prior to um, the the first encounter? Well, the only thing I remember seeing it was in the movie theater. We saw a movie about the UFO, the P-51 pilot that crashed uh, chasing a UFO. And it was just one of those uh, news thing, newsreel things that we saw in the movies. That was about it. That's uh -huh. all I knew about UFOs in that, in that sense. And that was like I was about maybe in the fifth, sixth grade. So yeah. I didn't pay too much attention to it. You know, and that was um, – I was – that was a period of time when there was all these uh, flying saucer movies, uh, creatures from outer space and all that stuff that was going on. So we all yeah. thought it was all part of the Hollywood thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you want to, now you had, was it two, uh, we're going to be talking about your encounter that you had. That I was, that I partook in. Let's oh. put it that way. Okay. Um, the, first, the first incident happened. We were en route. We had just left Midway Island when we were en route to Guam. Uh, and I was on watch. Uh, this was probably around the middle of January, January. I, I, I figured it was probably around the 24th of January, 1966. I was a quartermaster uh, third class, uh, QM3. Uh, and the quartermaster on a ship uh, steers the ship uh, into the harbor, out of the harbor, alongside other ships, etc. And we do, uh, we're also the assistant navigator. So we navigate the ship and that's our job uh, when we're on watch is to make sure that the ship is on course. And also we keep the ship's log and we're also the ship's weatherman. So on this night, I'm on the mid watch, uh, midnight to four. Uh, the bridge crew consists of two lookouts, a radio man, uh, the officer of the deck, uh, which is a senior officer, the junior officer of the deck, which is a junior officer. The boatswain's mate of the watch, uh, the messenger of the watch, the steersman or the helmsman, and the annunciator guy, the guy that runs the engines forward and back, and then myself, the quartermaster of the watch. And my job is to maintain the ship uh, stays on course, and I'm taking fixes about every or every 45 minutes, every every hour. We have to have a fix, and uh, and we go from there. So I had taken a break, and usually uh, at this point in time, the sky was incredibly clear you get what is called the dome effect in the middle of the ocean in other words you have horizon to horizon stars yeah. so mm -hmm. i would get my seven by 50 binoculars that i always had around my neck and i would just aim them straight up 90 degrees straight up and just look and just like realize how infinitely small we were in yeah. regard to the space that we were looking at and as i was looking at uh and with my binoculars i was looking at the stars and uh all of a sudden, I noticed there was a, a V formation, five little white dots moving very slowly, so almost like a satellite. So I immediately chewed out the lookouts that were above me. Uh, uh, sitting on, they're, they're standing on top of the bridge. So I chewed them out because I, you know, I was a quartermaster's third class, a uh, corporal in, in uh, the army, and I chewed them out. I said, you know, why did you? Report those lights. And they go, what lights? I said, those up there. Those right up there. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I said, you're, you're supposed to report those right away. So I informed the officer of the deck. We got a flight of uh, aircraft, probably aircraft, uh, heading from Guam, same way we are, because we were in a northwesterly uh, uh, direction at the time. So we just, you know, went through regular uh, rigmarole. Well, in other words, standard operating procedure. We call uh, CIC, Combat Information Center, and say, hey, what do you guys got on radar? 
And he said, oh, we don't have nothing on radar. I said, well, I said, we're looking at five objects, and they seem to be moving uh, along uh, pretty high up. Uh, they're all they're in a V formation, uh, headed the same direction we are. So well, that's why we assumed there was maybe a flight of B-52s. And then we were wondering why they had their landing lights on or something. <laughs> but at any rate, so um, at that point, the radio, the the radar man, the radar men say, "Well, why don't you contact Guam? We'll contact Guam, see what they've got coming in." So they contacted Guam Air Force Base, and Guam reported back right away, saying, "We we don't have anybody coming in. We don't know what you're looking at." So they suggested at that point, suggested uh, they con we contact uh, uh, Tachikawa Air Force Base in Japan. So the radar men contact Tachikawa Air Force Base, and they say, "Well, okay, we got these five things moving along, and." Nobody seems to know what they are. And uh, Tachikawa Air Force Base responded with a negative, saying, we have nothing in the air. We have we don't know what you guys are looking at. So they recommended the third radar site, which was in Hong Kong. And they said, the British radar, British have the strongest radar in this area. Why don't you contact them, see what they've got coming in? Okay, so we contact the British. Nothing. We said, we don't know what you guys are looking at. Same, we, we were getting the same response all the time. So but this time... We're all looking at these guys. We're all there with our binoculars. Now, we kept thinking if only they kept going straight and just kept going, we would have just forgotten about it and logged it as a five aircraft. And that was been the end. But these were moving along. And then all of a sudden, they made a 90 degree turn. I mean, literally, wham, bam, an L. And, they, and then just took off. I mean, this, just they just vanished. I mean, and we were, I was yelling, dead reckoning, dead reckoning. So I was looking towards the direction they went, and they were gone. So at that point, we all kind of lowered our binoculars slowly and just kind of looked at each other. And, and I just looked at the the operations officer, who was up, the officer of the, the OOD, the officer of the deck, senior officer, he was a full lieutenant. And I said to him, I said, um, how do I log that in? Uh, what was that, uh, Mach 20, Mach 20? 30, what speed was that? Uh, hmm. That was a 90 degree turn with no hesitation. They just boom, boom, uh, did an L. I mean, there was no arcing of a turn. An aircraft would arc. These guys, boom, boom, 90 degrees, uh, sh just sh a shift, change in direction. And then just took off. They just like vaporized, just like vaporized. They, just, they were gone. So I just looked at the, <laughs> the officer. Of the deck and i said how do i log that in i said and he said uh gentlemen i believe you call those ufos so at right. that point i said do i have permission to log it as such and he said log it in as you saw it quartermaster and i said i will log it in as i saw it things these are five objects making a 90 degree turn and then going at a fantastically high speed and the only thing the other thing the officer said at that point was gentlemen let us hope they are whoever they are they are on our side yeah. So that was it. So we logged I logged it in. The funny part about this situation is I was the guy that when a ship's log was filled, I was the guy that had a key to the ship's log locker, which was located in the forecastle of the destroyer that I was on. Uh, and uh, we would always put the logs in there and then mark them the date when they spilled out and everything else. So I went into after I put the log away, after the log was filled, I put them away. I went back into the ship's log because I wanted to take that page out. In other words, I wanted a souvenir because I, I knew whatever <laughs> we had witnessed was something very spectacular and something mm -hmm. very, very unusual. And it's something that it was starting to alter my consciousness about what I was doing and what we were doing, <laughs> things like that. So when I went to go pilfer the page of that log, the log was gone. Someone beat what? me to it. Wow. So, and I wasn't about to go asking questions, you know, hey, who took that log? <laughs> so wow. I, I figure it had to be an officer or someone else that had the key. I was the only enlisted man that had a key to that locker. And I believe the executive officer and another and the navigator, uh, which was an officer, had the key to that to that locker. So somebody saying the whole the whole log journal was gone? The whole book? The whole book. Wow. And uh, when something like that happens, isn't that really like something major? I mean, 
Well, we uh, we kept quiet about it. And the reason we kept quiet, uh, uh, we were afraid of ridicule. And um, and uh, we didn't want to have any anybody ridiculing us. And, uh, you know, the, the term, did you see any little green men too? That kind of would, would, would come yeah. up. I believe I told one other navigator, one other assistant navigator about it. And he just laughed. Yeah. So I figured, okay, we got to zip it. And, yeah. But I mean, there was, uh, let's see, uh, there were two lookouts, the boatswain's mate of the watch, the two officers, the messenger of the watch, and myself and a radio man were the witnesses to this. Yeah. And so when this thing, you're, you're, you're kind of unsure how far it is in elevation, how high it is in yeah. elevation. We but, figured these were at satellite height, we figured. And we knew about well, satellites because okay. we were aware of the echo satellite. Because All right, we so, okay, oh, go ahead. Well, my question is... We the echo satellite as a ruse for uh, officers that were learning how to use uh, a sextant. In other words, we knew right. the echo satellite was going to be over our head. But let me ask you this. Would, you, would a radar go to that height, to that level, to elevation? That I don't know. That you'd have to ask the radar thing. We had a 300 range, 300 mile range, uh, long range radar. I, I believe it was 300 miles. Wow. So that tells you anything. Uh, here's a question that came in a chat. When the light shot off, was the point of the V pointed in the direction of the movement? And that's a very good question. I was pointed in the direction of the what? Of the V, the forward V, like aerial aerodynamically. Yeah, the, the point of the V, it. I mean, they literally just went boom, boom, and the V always stayed the V to the front. Shifted, just literally shifted like that. Yeah, yeah. And they just, I mean, gone. I have to tell you a funny thing that did happen in 1977. I went to go see the movie Star Wars. I was living in Providence, Rhode Island. We yeah. went to see the movie Star Wars for the first time when it came out. And there's a scene where Han Solo puts his spaceship into hyperdrive or yeah. hyperspace. Well, when he did that, I reacted. And I, I out loud, and people in the audience in the, in the movie theater were telling me to shut up. Because I, I, I freaked. I just like, oh, my God, that's what those UFOs did in 1966. They're giving them to hyperspace. And everybody was like, shh, shh, sit down. <laughs> And I was just so excited because that was what it looked like to me. Like these UFOs, oh. when they made that 90 return, they just, they just, they didn't, they didn't, they just didn't turn and go, keep going. They were, they turned and took and gone, and they were gone. I mean, boom, vanished. Yeah. <laughs> this is what freaked us all out because we just, like I said, we all just kind of lowered our binoculars really slowly and just looked at each other like, okay, did you just see what I just saw? <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And so um, your other encounter was at close range. Am I, do I have that right? That's correct. Uh, and that was a little bit different encounter. Uh, we, by this time, we were off the coast of Vietnam. We, uh, we were maybe two, three miles, four miles, five miles off the coast of Vietnam. We were conducting shore bombardment off of the Quang Tree, I believe is the area we were operating in, just below the, uh, the uh, DMZ line, the 17th parallel. So we were moving back and forth, awaiting uh, orders from uh, uh, an aircraft. There was a spotter plane flying over the area, the ground area, uh, the, over the South Vietnam area, Quang Tri area. Uh, we, we were waiting for shore bombardment uh, targets. And um, as we were cruising along, I, I was on the bridge. I don't know why, I don't remember if I, I wasn't on watch. So I was probably conducting my normal duties on the bridge, going around. And uh, we weren't, we were maybe in a, a condition three battle station. So uh, I, I wasn't at a battle station. In other words, we weren't at full battle stations. When one of the, all of a sudden, bright day, it was sunny, hot, uh, humid. This is like about April 1966. Uh, when all of a sudden the lookouts start yelling, there's a ball in the water. There's, a, there's something in the water, a, a, a ball in the water, silver ball in the water. And this was about a, Oh, maybe 175 feet, 100 feet, say, I mean, 100 yards, 75 yards in front of us. So, 
So the ship slows down. We slow the ship is slowed down, and the captain is brought is called to the bridge. The captain comes to the bridge, and he says, "What's going on?" He says, there, "There's a, the lookouts report. There's a, a silver ball in the water uh, ahead of us." So the captain says, "Orders immediately turn the ship off." So all everything, all the systems go off. And the ship's engines turned off. Everything's turned off. Pretty soon it gets really eerie because it's really silent. And then the captain tells these two officers get into the safe and the safe was under the chart desk so i had a, a chart desk where i in the uh, in the pilot house where i you know where we work on the chart or where we did our fixes uh and so we had the, the chart in our uh, in our on the chart desk so they open the safe and they bring out this huge book this huge notebook and i mean it, and it says warsaw warsaw pack weapons and then it says top secret across it and they said kiros yeah, we all went by our last name. So he said, kiddos, look away. You only have a secret clearance. This is a top secret thing. So I had to turn my head away and not look at the book, but, you know, I could look at it. And they were they were looking through mines, the mine mine area. So they're looking to see what kind of mine it is. Because we thought, at that point, we thought it was a mine. Because yep. it was just bobbing below the surface. We're just bobbing. So at that point, the captain says, uh, we're not going to get near. Back the ship up slightly. So we back the ship up. By this time, you know, the residual, you know, when we turn the ship up, we're still moving. So by this right. time, the captain says, yeah, we got to back the ship up because we were getting closer to this object. So the captain said, we don't want to deal with this nonsense. We don't want to deal with this thing. We don't know what it is. So we call the helicopter. Uh, we had an aircraft carrier in the area. I, I forget which aircraft. We were operating with maybe three aircraft carriers at the time. I, one of the main ones we were operating with was the uh, Enterprise. Well, and speaking of, of names, here's a question here. What was the name of that ship again? The one you were on? I was on the USS Wetterburn, DD-684. Wetterburn? Wetterburn. Wetterburn, okay. Here's a Thank you. Oh, there it is right there, Wetterburn. I got it. Yep. Wetterburn. Yep. It's a Fletcher that. class, 2100, 2100 Fletcher class destroyer. We still had our five gun mounts. Nice, you had that book handy like that. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, the yearbook I worked on uh, yeah. uh, for the the cruise. It's a cruise book. So consequently, we all the helicopter comes in. By this time, we've got the, the the helicopter pilots on our radio, so he's talking. We can hear him. So I started filming. I got my I had an eight millimeter camera, a regular eight millimeter camera. So I started filming a little bit, getting it going, and the captain turns and sees me. With the camera, he says, put that thing away, Kiros. And I go, yes, sir. <laughs> I put the camera away. So I got no footage of anything because I just barely started when he, when he saw me. And uh, so the helicopter comes, goes in front of us, uh, and lowers a, um, a, a, uh, a cable or a, some kind of a device down, a long cable. And it's some kind of sonar device. And... Um, He's describing it to us. He's, you know, over the over the radio, we're listening on, on the bridge. We're listening to the, the broadcast on the bridge. And he's saying it's a smooth ball, silver, six feet diameter, no seams, no markings, no rivets. It's totally smooth. So he says it doesn't seem to be doing anything. So I said, so I'm looking at this point, I'm looking at the chart, trying to figure, you know, and we had we were off the coast. So there's a lot of shoals and weird. The, the ground is kind of strange. In fact, we had to use some old French charts that showed uh, sand, sandy shoals and things like that. So we're concerned about not running the ground a little bit. Uh, so at this point, the helicopter is lowering this thing, and he's not getting anything out of the cable he lowers. He raises the cable up, and he says, we're going to try something. So we, we were like, what's he going to do? Also, we realized he... Uh, kind of puts the helicopter to one side a little bit, and the side gunner opens fire. So by this time, we're seeing tracers flying off of this thing. So we're ducking down on the bulwark of the ship of the bridge. We're like, whoa, this guy's shoot. This guy doesn't realize these tracers are flying all over the place. And then all of a sudden, the helicopter pilot sells, starts yelling, it took off, it took off, it took off. And he's, the helicopter goes into a spin and flies kind of, like in its direction of where it took off. So the captain immediately orders, turn the ship back on, 
Sound general quarters. This is not a drill. We're going to general quarters. Set the ASW anti-submarine warfare team in action. So there's the bong, bong, bong. We're going to general quarters. We start chasing this thing. Uh, we don't even know what it is. Uh, so we think it's maybe some kind of trans. At this point, they're discussing some kind of transponder device from a submarine. So we had our sonar going. We're looking for a submarine of some kind. We searched for 72 hours, which is standard operating procedure. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. No submarines. No, nothing. There was nothing in the area. It was clear water. So we don't know what the heck it was and what it was doing there and how it took off and who pulled it. Because <laughs> it it sounded like somebody had pulled it, pulled it underwater. So that's why we thought we thought it was a submarine, because it it went down when it <laughs> so yeah. and we never I never saw it. We never we never really saw it because it was, you know, under just under the surface of the water. The lookouts just saw the shimmer of this this thing. Now, we knew what mines looked like because we had encountered a World War II mine and had one of our sharpshooters exploded. Now, when this thing took off, was there sonar in use or anything like that? Oh, yeah, we, yeah we, we turned everything on at that point. When that thing took off, our sonar was, our, our, our sonar operators were, everything was on, back on. I mean, it was like instantaneous, everything went back on. The ship, we started the ship up, everything. Yep. Off we went. And the only question I had was the fact that the water, we were in a kind of a shallow area. And I, I mentioned to one of the officers, I don't know if a submarine can operate in this water. This kind of shallow area. We're off the coast. We're not we're not really in deep, deep water. <laughs> so uh, that was the only question I had. And and for this to this day, I have no idea what it was. And it was it didn't and I kind of almost kind of forgot about it a little bit. And I even brought it up with a former shipmate of mine and asked him, do you remember the silver ball incident? And he says, no, I don't. He says, yeah, because it, it was something that, you know, we didn't see anything. So we figured it's a sight unseen. Wow. Well, that that's something else. I, I wish there could have been some data showing, you know, with the speed that this thing had. Um, um Hang on just one second. Sure. Uh, yeah, I just I wish there was some data where they could have seen the speed of this thing traveling un underwater, you know? Yeah, we, we don't know. The helicopter pilot was the one that saw it took off. He saw it take off. Well, now, did you see? 75 yards ahead of us. So were you, were you actually watching at the time? Yes, I was. And did you see any wake in the water, any movement in the water? And the reason I'm bringing that up, and I think it's your your answer is interesting, because all, uh, other accounts of what they call USOs, unidentified submerged submerged oh. object or submersible, uh, whatever it is, is that there's transmedium movement without causing disturbance, which is very very strange. Like for instance, when these things are seen to go in or out of the water, there's no splash, oh. and and they're also seen, and I'm not. I'm not saying this is what you saw. I don't know what you saw, but we don't know they, what we saw either. <laughs> <laughs> when they travel underwater at high speeds, it almost doesn't even make any sense how yeah. they can do that in in out of in and out of the the, the different mediums. Um, well, it, you know, it's just like the. I never forgot the words of the helicopter pilot because you know it just he he it, he sounded scared. I mean, he sounded like he was you know yelling. It took off. It took off. And it was like, wow. And, and he was turning his helicopter, was, you know, going into a, uh, like a spin. And we we're like, well, what, what, did, what does he mean it took off? <laughs> we didn't see anything take off. <laughs> so, yeah. so it, it almost sounded like something like somebody had pulled it on from underwater or it went on its own. And we don't know. We, we, I, I honestly have to say, I really don't know whether it was pulled or it went, or it went on its own. But whatever it was, it went underwater and it took off. Can you? Yeah. Can you explain again what exactly who who fired on this thing? Someone fired on it. The, the, the helicopter fired on it. Yeah. And, and, and we couldn't believe it. We we just you know all of a sudden he just opened up the 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 door gunner just all of a sudden just started shooting and uh, like I said there was 
tracers are flying off in the air. And it was like, and all of a sudden we like freaked out a little bit. But I remember ducking down behind the bulwark and I was like, what is this guy doing? Well, it's a wonder, <laughs> it's a wonder they would do that. You're only 75 yards or so away. And if this thing blew up, I mean, it seems like it could have caused some damage to the helicopter as well. I mean, I, it's kind I of a strange know. reaction. And I it wonder, uh, you know, this was, uh, we were off the coast of Vietnam. So, you know, yeah, I guess, I guess you had to take all the precautions. And yeah. so he was basically, it sounds like he was, if you thought it was a mine, he was trying to blow it up. Yeah. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, the other thing is uh, when they were looking through the Warsaw Pact book, there was nothing that, of that description in the book. And they well, let you know that they let you know well, that the much. Uh, explain to explain to the captain. There's nothing in the book. There's no no smooth silver ball in the book. Yeah. Well, the Warsaw Pact nations do not have a silver ball, smooth silver ball with no seams or no spikes or anything. Just a smooth silver ball, six foot diameter. There was no such thing unless it was a new secret weapon. We don't know. We you know we're we're speculating now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's 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 so much. Uh, speculation when it comes to this um and you know it wouldn't be surprising if you told me the thing rose up out of the water either you know i mean that that would have been quite spectacular and and uh, so you search for 72 hours in the yeah, direction standard of operating procedure is a 72 hour search yeah. so for three days we chased nothing and radar had nothing and we we kept going in, in circles literally zigzagging and doing all kinds of maneuvers thinking where this thing might have gone and nothing we yeah. turned up nothing and what was this what was this speculation uh submarine transponder device and was with something submarine belonged to a submarine in the oh area. i see and it pulled it back down yeah that's what they thought i mean because yeah no, nobody was in us. You know, that was. The, I mean, we were we were talking. You know, normal military kind of thinking. You know, yeah. okay, you got a ball that's floating in the water. Oh, whose ball is it? Well, it has to belong to somebody. It must belong to another another ship or something. Yeah, <laughs> we just didn't know what ship. Yeah, yeah. So it was one of those mysteries. You know, you you're left scratching your head and you go like, okay, what's next? Yeah, yeah. And, um, that's about it. And, uh, and we, to this day, we don't know what we saw. And then now, again, now with what's happening today with these little these uh, sphere, the spheres that are going into the water, I'm starting to wonder, was that one of those things or or what? I don't know. Right, right. Um, there, uh, I had a, a friend, um, he's been on the show many times, Mark D'Antonio, and he was on a an excursion on a a, a submarine um, as a guest because of some work that he did that was related to it. Uh -huh. And they had, they had something moving that they called a fast mover. That was, uh, they already had a term for it. It was uh -huh. going over 200 knots and underwater. And, and he figured this is, I think it was, he said it was in the nineties or maybe early two thousands. Uh -huh. You know, we didn't have any technology that would do that speed. No. And, you know, you the think highest, of the fastest ship at that time in 1966 was the USS Enterprise. Yeah. Uh, carrier. Yeah. Uh, whenever they would launch their planes. And there was areas in the in the Tonkin Gulf where there was no wind. So the aircraft carrier had to create wind. Oh, and wow. One, at one time, we chased that carrier. He signaled back to us, uh, Mike Speed, 60 plus knots. And we're going 25, almost 30 knots, and we were popping rivets. Literally, our, I was on a World War II destroyer. We're, yeah. uh, we're moving through the water at 30 knots. Our ship was taking, was rumbling. We were in a rumble. And by the time we caught up to the aircraft carrier, they had already launched their, their aircraft and were coming back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we were, they were going plus 60 knots. On the water, on the surface. Well, it takes so. I I know, remember reading an article one time about um, boating. You know, like power boating. So yeah. for every knot, 
it takes so much more power and the higher you go up, like if you want your, your, uh, your motorboat to go 80 knots, it takes an enormous amount of power yeah. once you get over like 40 knots to make it go higher. So if you can picture something that is submerged traveling at two over 200 knots, I mean, it just seems like it would take, uh, you know, an enormous, and it takes an enormous amount of pressure around you know uh to make something like that happen a question that richard has here the tracer bullets were actually ricocheting off the object is that what yes. you that's so yeah. they were shot with tracer bullets well every so every other i think i forget what the what they how it's loaded i i didn't know how it was loaded i mean we saw tracers and it were, i mean there wasn't like a steady stream of tracers. this was like maybe every five or six rounds or something in other words Every once in a while, you'd see a, a, a tracer shoot off. That's what yeah. what, what scared us. Is we, is we started to see the tracers because, you know, normally if you know, maybe I, I know we carried fifty caliber machine guns on our ship, um, and um, I think there was maybe every six rounds was a tracer or something like that. I forget the the, the military term of it because I never had to fire the machine guns. I that wasn't my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um well, wow, so these things happened to you, and w what was it like, um, you know, behind the scenes? Like, did, for instance, let's go back to the first encounter, and was like in the mess hall or whatever. W was there talk, you know, like, hey, well, what do you think? We didn't bring it up. We didn't bring, didn't it, bring up. it up. Yeah. Nobody that was on the watch brought brought it up because I think we were afraid of ridicule. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you uh, how to be aware of uh, when you're on a small, well, a small ship. You got a crew of 250 men uh, aboard this destroyer. And like I said, it's a Fletcher class, 2100 class destroyer. And um, there was a lot of harassment all the time. I mean, if somebody got a Dear John letter, everybody on the ship knew it. And you and that poor guy had it for, the, for about a month until somebody else, uh, you could harass somebody else. I mean, there was always that kind of. It was almost a um, rite of passage kind of a thing, if you want to say. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember, for example, for myself, I wrote a letter to my girlfriend and then I threw it away and tore, it, put it in the garbage can. My mistake was throwing it in the garbage can because then it was pulled out by other crewmen and they was and they all had a section of the letter and was read out loud in front of all the crewmen. So you can oh. imagine. Oh, oh, that's okay? awful. So, you, so you, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. That's the kind oh, of thing I'm talking about. That so, is so terrible. You know, so my reaction to when they were reading my letter, I, I, I responded by saying, where'd you find the letter? In the garbage. Yeah, that's where you guys were, in the garbage, huh? Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. you had to learn how to throw it back or else. Yeah, you know, yeah. What's yeah, the yeah. call of weakness in you, boy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was your so, torment for the rest whoops. of your screws. This, this, uh, this question is, I don't know if you even know it. Are these M14 Tracer of 50 caliber? I have no idea what they yeah. were shooting. Yeah. Well, um, all right. Going back to the first I, I don't think it was a 50 caliber. I do not think it was 50 caliber. Okay. Because so, a 50 caliber machine gun is a pretty heavy machine gun. It's about 85 pounds. And the reason I know that is that I one of my jobs when we went to general quarters, we had a 50 caliber machine gun that was strapped to the side of our chart house. In other words, our where we worked on charts, our chart room. And, and my job when we went to general quarters was to take that 50 caliber machine gun that was strapped to the wall, throw it over my shoulder, go up the ladder to the bridge, hand it to the gunner's mates who were on top of the bridge and they had a machine gun mount on top of the bridge. Hmm. Wow, <laughs> that sounds, those things are pr probably pretty heavy too, to yeah, move around pounds. like that. 85 pounds. 85 pounds amazing wow. <laughs> yeah yeah so when you're looking at this let's talk about the first in, encounter um yeah it's amazing that you just happen to be looking up and, and well, it was it. it was um the thing i it was the way i relaxed you know once i i did a fix and and and, and sh showed the officer of the deck where we were in the position of the ship how we were doing did we need to change course how was our drift? And, you know, all these kind of things that you do when you're navigating. 
Uh, what kind of drift do you have? Do we have a following sea? Do we, are we going against the sea? Uh, are we doing good time? Or are we going to arrive when we're supposed to arrive? Because we were, our job was to rendezvous with some other destroyers before we pulled into into Guam, so we could pull in as a uh, in a column. So um, that was, and we were kind of operating by ourselves. So in in points of relaxing, you know, uh, you I would just get my binoculars and look straight up and just. I really enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun just looking up and yeah. seeing the, all the stars. Just, a, just an incredible view. And, and if anybody's ever seen that, you'll understand what you, what I'm talking about when you get the what is called the dome effect. Yeah, uh, being under a dome. Yeah, yeah. So well, anything I, moving, boy, you spot it. Yeah, I I did a I was doing other other shows and I actually had the pleasure of meeting and doing a interview with a, a gentleman that was at the time, I think someone else has beat the record. It's not a record you want to beat. And that is to be how long he was by himself in a life uh, raft, you know, trying to survive until he was found. And I forget how many days it was. It was all many, many, many days. And so um, after I did the interview, um, of course, it had nothing to do with UFOs. It was completely about his survival and which was an, an amazing story all on its own. There was a book written about it, um, a drift it was called. But anyway, um, so I said, Hey, uh, by the way, you know, I do a show on UFOs too. And I said, you were out at sea in the dark every night. And, you know, you could see all the stars and everything. Did you ever see anything weird? And he goes, yes. And so I go, like, can you talk about, you know, I try to get more information. He's, well, you know, maybe another time I'll talk about it, you know, that type yeah. of thing. But so, yeah, you're out there, you have the vast sky and, you know, if something is going to happen, it's kind of like you think about commercial pilots, you know, they have when they're up in the sky, they have, if it's clear, you know, you can see a big range, hundreds of miles in, in right. all directions, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no way to tell exactly how the high this thing is. Um, the radar thing is a little um, murky to me because I'm I'm not sure. Did you say that they can see within 300 miles? Is that what you said? Surface radar. It's a Re surface radar. Surface radar. Yeah. Okay. The radars on the ship are in, are are for well they had one air, uh, they had a small they have we have two radar devices on the mass. A small one on the very top, and then a large search radar uh, uh, right below that one. And I, I don't know what their full function. I know that the bottom one had a range of 300, but it was a surface radar. In other words, they couldn't aim it up. Oh, now the other. So think, this is why it was suggested to to uh, contact Guam Air Force Base to see who they had coming in. Yeah, we thought it was a flight of B-52s. You know. Yeah. I mean but that was, was that a issue reaction. And I mean, we were real casual about it. Hey, there's five five aircraft up there, you know. And must be, and we were very casual, very quiet. You know, it must be a flight of B-52s. And then, and then you, you know, hey, see, I see. What do you got? You know. And then, was, then all of a sudden, then it changed. You know, the all of a sudden the focus started changing. And also when 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 Wam said to check with Tachikawa Air Force Base, said, something's going on here. And. Uh, like I said, we went through three radar sites or three radar stations, and uh, they said we don't know what you're looking at. So the three, you know, I'm just <coughs> going to hang in here just a little bit on the radar. So the different radar stations. What I'm trying to get at is, if there was an object up at possibly satellite height, because satellites can go way, way high, but um, but possibly at say lower satellite height uh, in elevation. Are there radars that could capture something like that? That's what I was trying to get at. Do you know? I, 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 you're asking the wrong guy. I had that. I, yeah. I really don't know. I, I, we were just following procedure. This is a, a standard operating procedure. You, you call one person, they say no. You check with this person. Okay, we'll check with that person. Yeah. Okay. The person says check with that person. Okay, we'll check with that person. That's what we were doing. We were just yeah. checking off what we were going through the procedures and uh, and this, you know. Uh, we're, and we're thinking like a U.S. military ship. We're we're not thinking it very casual. We were at first we were taking it casually because it just looked like an aircraft aircraft flying along. But when 
the last radar said, we don't know what you're looking at. That's when we all were looking at them. That's when we all had our binoculars yeah. looking at them. And that's when, and the sensation, I don't know, maybe I, I maybe it's just my own feeling, but the sensation was they picked up that we were looking at them or something. And they decided to change course all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah. I've never seen anything maneuver like that in my life. Right. To this day, I've never seen anybody that could be moving along and then make a 90 degree turn without hesitation and just boom, gone. And I yeah. mean, they were gone like that. Would you and, say that uh, they were gone like in a streak or were they gone like vanish? Uh, both streak and vanish. Yeah. <laughs> they just okay. like zoomed out. I mean, the minute they made that turn, they were, they took off. I mean, they just like, Zap. And we that's what I started yelling, dead reckoning, dead reckoning, assuming that they would appear at a certain direction. Dead reckoning means you you're following, you're trying to follow their direction. Ah. So you I was yelling, dead reckoning, dead reckoning. And, and we all kind of aimed our binoculars where we thought they might be next, but they were oh. gone. They yeah. were totally, totally gone. Yeah. So did this thing did this thing fly in the same structure of V? Like you never saw that change. Like what I'm trying to ask you, it looked like possibly like a triangular shape, uh, or so, possibly a V shape. So the V they were uh they were a V like this. Yeah. So it's one, two, three, four, five lights in a yep. V. Yeah. One point and two on the side. Yeah. Now here's here's something someone called in one time and posed a very good question, and that why would they have lights? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not asking that question, but I, I'm just saying that is a very good question. If if whatever it is traveled whatever it is to get here, and is like way up there, why would they bother to have lights? They don't need lights, but but obviously these things seem to have lights most of the time. They were five, like, uh, five dots lit up. Yeah, it's almost like uh, whatever it is is not afraid that someone is seeing it, and it's almost like here I am. You can see. Yeah, me. it was. Um, I'll, I'll... And I, you know, I think one of the. This is what it, like that. Here. Yeah. Well, I could tell you're an artist if you can. Yep. I could tell you are an artist if you can draw that quickly and that evenly. <laughs> well, it's it was embedded in my mind. I mean, it 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 really it after that incident, I was I have to admit to you, I was very pro pro Navy, pro government, pro everything when I was in the Navy. I mean, we were you know we were on our way to our. This was why I was on my second tour. Uh, we were on our our second cruise to to the Vietnam area, Vietnamese area. So we were very. Uh, how should I say? positive about what we were doing. I mean, we felt very positive. There was no, we did have a one conscientious objector on the ship and he jumped off the ship uh, in a serious situation. He jumped off the ship? Yeah. Like he was gone forever? No, 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 we picked him up. We oh, had you picked him up. Oh my God, wow. Well, I'll tell you the situation. We were uh, assisting uh, Vietnamese Marines uh, landing. Um, where Vietnamese Marines were conducting a, a landing on this beach area, and we were to provide gunfire support for them. And um, so we're waiting for, I, I'm on the bridge at the time, but that was my battle station at that point. Uh, we switched our battle stations. The navigators were always switching their battle stations. Sometimes we'd be on the bridge, we'd be in after steering, we'd be in the secondary con. We were always moving around and just to give, give ourselves a little bit of variety. So this time I was on the bridge and we were, Conducting this, uh, uh, the, the, these Vietnamese Marines landed uh, with little boats and stuff, and we were going to go gunfire support. While we were waiting for the orders for to open fire, uh, we, we kept hearing somebody yelling, "I am a conscientious objector. I am against the war in Vietnam." We were, we're looking around. Who the hell is that? Who the hell's yelling? Finally, somebody said, "Look up at the mast." And we looked up at the mast, and there's this guy at the very top of the mast, and we're going slow because we're on gunfire support. So the ship is yawing back and forth. So the mast is going like this. So oh. I'm thinking, or if that guy jumps the wrong time, he's going to hit the deck. Right. But if he 
you know, he's going to have to wait till the ship's yaws over the ocean. Then he's going to have to do his jump. And that's, that's when a long he gets jump, too. That's a very and, high jump. Uh, I thought, hmm, this, you know, I hope he jumps in deep water, hits deep water, because there's a lot of shoals. We were in an area, and these wow. shoals were marked with bamboo sticks sticking out. The fishermen, the Vietnamese fishermen, have yep. these bamboo sticks sticking out of the water. So we have to maneuver away from them. And so he jumped, and we had to call off what we were doing uh, to rescue him. Because now we had a man overboard. Right. So right. we rescued him, brought him aboard the ship. People were really angry with him. There was um, hmm. some intended yeah. violence towards him because we were in a combat situation, and here's this guy jumping off. And we've been waiting for this combat situation for so long. And finally, here we are getting into action, and this guy disrupts it by jumping off the ship. So yeah. the captain brought they brought him up to the bridge. He's soaking wet. The captain looks at him. He says, "You're lucky that the Cong Congress has not declared war, uh, because if anything, we would have this was desertion under fire. We would have just shot him." Jeez, wow! Desertion under fire. Wow. Uh, going back uh, to anyway. you, here's the uh, a question: Has your guest had a sighting since? We will talk about that later after the break. We're going into the break here in just a couple of minutes, and it's a five minute break. Okay. Um, but, uh, now you, did I hear you say that there was, you knew someone else that also had a, uh, an encounter during the war? Yeah. One of one of the navigators, uh, uh, told me that he actually came down and woke me up. Uh -huh. He was on watch and he said they were looking at the, the ground. Uh, cause you, you know, we'd watch the action at night. We were, we could watch the action at night, you know, tracers going back and forth. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, who runs the war. And he said that there was an amber light that flicked, went back and forth, was going back and forth, an amber light, and then that the amber light shot straight up and took off, disappeared. Huh. Wow. So it's an amber light. So I, I said, well, there's only, according to the U.S. Navy, there's only two kinds of things, two kinds of vehicles that would have amber lights. One is a submarine, and the other one is a hovercraft. Hovercraft don't shoot straight up. <laughs> yeah. So, so he, and he said it was the weirdest thing, man. It was the weirdest, kept going back and forth, back and forth, really fast. And then it all of a just went, choo, straight up. And I was like, wow. are you waking me up for that? <laughs> <laughs> so, was, uh, oh, so this happened on the same ship or another ship yeah. that you were on? Same ship. Yeah. Same, same, same time. Yeah. Did you start to like question like what the heck is going on here? I mean, uh, we did, and you know, I had a roommate who was first air cab, and he told me about a time they were out in the field because I told him the story about the UFO thing, and then he said, you know, and the the, fu the funny thing is, we had provided uh, gunfire support for this for this. Uh, this first air cab. In fact, we had provided shotgun support. In other words, they were driving along what is Highway One in Vietnam, and we were going along the, the water, providing gunfire support, protecting them. And he remembered the number on my ship and wrote to me. He says, "Is your ship number six eighty four?" And I wrote back to him, "Yeah, that's my ship. So, ah, you guys were providing gunfire, uh, providing a, a shotgun for us." Uh, you were writing shotgun for us. And I'm like, wow, it's an incident, incident, incident. So here he was talking. We were talking. This is after we got out of the service. He was my roommate when I was going to art school. And um, we were talking. And he said, you know, what you, a weird thing happened to us. And I said, what was that? He said, we were out in the field. And it was at night. And all of a sudden, this big black thing went over us real slow. And he said, and the pressure... He said, all of a sudden, all of us just, all of us just lay down. Oh, my God. And it just like went over us and then it just passed. And it was I just, can't believe you're saying this because. It was a black, I, it was a dark black thing. He said, and it went over us. Yeah. And he said, he said, we literally had to lay down. Yes. <laughs> this is, uh, this is really fascinating because I have a guest from Australia that is going to be talking, you know, briefly um, on my show about something very similar. She told wow. me the story about, God, she told me the story about nine years ago that her and her grandmother were in their garden and this black 
triangle floated very slowly over them and made the pressure like they had to go lay down on the ground. Wow. Wow. Same. That's right. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, amazing. You got to realize this is all the same year, 66. Wow. It's well, we have to go. It's time for us to go into commercial break. Okay. And it's a treat for those of you uh, at, on YouTube and uh, also on Facebook watching uh, because we have a five minute clip about a UFO sighting um, that happened outside of Detroit. And it's pretty interesting. So for those of you over at KGRA Radio, we'll be right back right after this five minute break. All right, so I'm with Mark Richard and he had a sighting outside of the building you're in right now. You're working? Right now? Yes. I'm actually, I, I live and work in the uh, building. I'm the head of maintenance for the apartment building. So wow. uh, my yeah. sighting actually happened back in 2008. I don't have the exact date, but I think it was somewhere late October, early November of 2008. And can you explain exactly something caught your eye out the window? Yes. Uh, I was working at the time. I think it was maybe around 2 p.m. or so. And uh, it was a bright, sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. Something kept reflecting light into my eye. Every time I would look up from my work, this something out the window is reflecting this light into my eye. After about the third or fourth time of this happening, I'm getting a little annoyed. And I walked over to the window. Uh, this old historic building. We have huge windows. Uh Walked over to the window and I'm looking at this thing. I can see it. I'm in downtown Detroit. I've been here for several years, so I'm used to seeing traffic copters. I thought it was a traffic copter. It looked like it was over the expressway out there, maybe like a mile and a half, two miles out. It was out there a little ways. Um, so I lay eyes on this thing, and pretty much as soon as I do, it starts moving towards kind of my general direction. And I'm still thinking at the time this is a, hel a helicopter. It's annoying. Uh, it with the clip that this thing moved towards me, I'm starting to second guess now, is this a helicopter or not? Because this thing was covering this mile and a half, two miles very quickly. Within seconds, it was it was outside of my building and slowly coming towards me uh, to the point where, where this craft, I've got, I'm now in full view of a craft that is um, hovering outside of my, I'm on the 13th story of an 18 story building this thing's hovering outside of my window, it starts to rotate up so that I, it's now sort of 90 degrees to me where I'm looking directly at the bottom of this craft. It's got three large white lights on the bottom and a, a smaller red light in the center that's kind of pulsing. And this thing starts to rotate clockwise and the three white lights start flashing a pattern and it's rotating and the pattern's going a little bit faster and a little bit faster. And then the outside edges of these white lights start to flash in colors. So now I'm getting every color of the rainbow. It reminded me of one of those Simon games from back in the 80s where you try to hit oh, the, yeah. hit the yeah. colors. It was right. something like that as it's rotating and it's speeding up to by the time this thing was at full bore, it was just a blur of light like the most vivid, bright, colorful light. And um, at that point, I kind of felt like I was being sort of mesmerized or being kind of drawn in mentally by this thing. And it made me pause and it made me sort of put almost a mental block right there where I said, hold on, what's what's going on here? This is obviously very strange. Um, I've never seen anything like this before. And um, when I did that, when I kind of put a mental stop to it and kind of put the brakes on things mentally, uh, the flashing light stopped. The the craft slowly rotated back down to uh, an upright position, and it just kind of floated off to my right-hand side and kind of floated around the building to where I couldn't see it anymore. I was expecting to see this thing shoot off into space or something. It never did. It just uh, It just kind of floated off slowly. I tried to keep my eye on it for as long as I could. And once I lost sight of it, I actually ran down to uh, the, the uh, street level to try to get outside and get my eyes back on it. But I had lost it at that point and it was gone. Wow. 
Well, uh, we're already up to four minutes. Oh so, my gosh. <laughs> so that's okay. Well, that's all right. Uh, we'll be running a little bit longer of a commercial that day. We'll run it uh, four minutes and 30 seconds. Bill always likes it over at KGRA when I can run uh, longer, but we're out of time now. Mark, thank you so much. That's a really interesting sighting. Very Great, thank you. Stand by, Martin. In three, two, one, go. All right. Welcome back. Uh, Bill probably really liked that when I said that we like he they like the long breaks over at KGRA Radio for the commercials. But anyway, uh, back with my guest, uh, Alfred. Thank you, uh, Alfred, again for uh, uh, talking about this. It's always I always enjoy people that have never talked about this before, and it's something new and fresh, something very interesting. Actually, the last encounter you told me about this black thing and then the pressure and those people like push him to the ground. I think that's so fascinating because um, you're going back to 1966 and uh, the woman that'll be on the show, I think we're going back to the late 1970s when she was young. Mm -hmm. And so these things, you know, people, People can say all they want about, you know, secret military craft, black projects, things like that. But did could they possibly possibly have had that technology starting in 1966 that would never be used by us in any type of situation? You know, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I It just makes me wonder. I mean, I have read quite a bit about German technology and World War II and what they were working on. And of course, you know, there's speculation that the Germans have, were developing a UFO. And they, I've read some accounts where they actually flew a craft uh, in, uh, I believe it was in Prague, uh, Czechoslovakia. They flew a craft and it went up to 2,000 miles per hour. But it's all speculation. We, we really don't know if that really happened because they destroyed all the, the records of that of that uh, craft because they didn't want the Russians to get a hold of it or something like that. And then there's some people that believe the uh, UFOs that were sighted in 1946, the first UFOs the, where the term flying saucer was used uh, by that photog by that pilot in uh, Washington, I believe. 47, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And they and think. Final. Uh, that there is some connection with British intelligence that was working in that area of British Columbia. I don't know. There's a, a lot of things I've read, and I've always read these things with a grain of salt. I, you know, I kind of like, okay, uh, do you have the pen? Even when I look at a photograph, I, I, uh, I, I wonder about it. I, I have to show you what started this thing with with uh, with Mufon and I was uh, back in April of this year. Um, I'm an artist, and I saw a cloud that had this incredible yellowish tinge to it. And I said, wow, that is a really wild yellow, and it's so pale. I wonder if I can catch it with a camera. So I went and grabbed my camera, and I shot a picture of it. Can I show you the picture? Uh, oh, yes. Matter of fact, um, you can send the picture to me, and I will put it in the show notes permanently. Okay, so I'll do that. Uh, so go ahead here's... and hold Hold that up right now. Here's the picture I took of the cloud. Yep. Uh, I didn't notice anything until I downloaded the camera and saw this little black speck. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it, yep. You got to hold it up more, but yeah. And I saw that little black speck, and I go, what the heck is that? I said, that was, I didn't see that. I didn't see it. When I took the photograph, I didn't see it. The photograph was shot at five sixths of a second. I mean, five sixths of uh, the uh, focal uh, uh, opening was five sixths of, and the speed was one five hundredth of a second. I took two photographs, uh, this one, and then a shot of zoom back and took another shot. By the, the second shot, the object is gone. 
So here's a close up of it. I can't see it. It's got to come up. Got to come up. There you go. There. Okay. There's a close up of it. So, um, I, I don't know what that is. so when you were in, when the investigator came, um, the person that connected us two together, uh -huh. did, did he rule out? I know this sounds really bizarre, but did he rule out either an insect or bird? No. In fact, they called it uh, they, they, they called it a blurfo. B l u r f o, blurfo. I said I have never heard of that term blurfo, and they sent me a long explanation of what a blurfo was. It could be a bird, an insect, <laughs> uh, uh, and I and I looked at the photograph and I said. That's got to be a really large insect because that thing was further away than the cloud. It almost seemed to be in the same distance as the cloud. And both uh, Robert Frasconi and I both noticed that there was a kind of a little trail, a very, very, very slight trail uh, behind this object. And I said, I don't know what I, what I photographed. I didn't see it. I never saw the object. This thing yeah. was moving one five hundredth of a second. So, you know, it's beyond my high speed. So, yeah. so, so and uh, that's what started this whole thing. And so once we started, I met with Mr. I, I met over the phone with Mr. Frascone. Uh, we started talking about it. And then he asked me if I had any other any experience, other experiences. And then I told him about my Navy experiences. And then he told right. me about you. And that's how we got, that's where right. we are now. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, I think one of the most interesting aspects of your first encounter is that the ship's log was missing after that. Yeah. You I know? thought that was very, very strange that somebody would take the ship's log. Yeah. And I mean, why? had that ever happened prior or had you ever noticed that happening at any other time? No, no, ever, ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and we would, you know, and the ship's logs were big. You know, they're like about uh, eight and a half by fourteen. You know, yep. paper bound and all that stuff. And 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 on the front, you have a start date when you start the log, and et cetera, et cetera. And you record everything in the ship's log. You know, Joe Blow cut his finger. Uh, the corpsman applied a band aid. He's okay. Yep. He went back to work. That yep. kind of thing goes in the ship's log. So every little thing that goes on in the ship is uh, recorded. So. Yeah, of so course, and that's diary. In other words, it's been that way for centuries. Yeah, you know, and um, you know, so it is really odd how that that whole thing disappeared, and you never saw it. Now, let me ask you this: So, what do you do? Get a new log and you start again? You know, well, yeah. Once you finish a log, you put the end date on it, or the the last date on it. You sign yeah. it, and you sign it. You say, okay, this has been signed by whoever finished the last slog and then you put the date and they say, okay, give it to, give it to kiddos to, to put it in the, in the log, uh, uh, locker. So okay. then we start a new log. You start a new log, date, first date. And everything yep. else. So we had and, a stack of, you know, new logs ready yeah. to go. So yeah. we never, we would never run out. Right. And wh what about the documentation of the second encounter? That was probably put in the ship's log also. I was not in charge of the ship's log at that time. Somebody I else see. was uh, in charge of uh, writing that up. Yeah. That's so whoever cool. was the quartermaster at that time, and I could, there was, well, there was like uh, four of us. There was a first-class petty officer, a second-class petty officer, two seamen, and myself, a third-class petty officer. And wow. uh, so it was either... Uh, it had to be one of the petty officers that was uh, writing the log. So it was either uh, the second class petty officer, the first class petty officer, or myself. And I was at that that, that time I was not writing the ship's log. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When okay, so let's now I'm just gonna just change the conversation a little bit. So when you so when you saw this, I'm asking about your personal experience. You saw this object. It seemed to appear to be at a very high elevation, but then it all of a sudden it did things you can't explain, right. and every and you were in, among many witnesses that right. that saw this, all saw it happen at the same time. Right. Um, what was your your um, aftermath thoughts about what you saw? Like, did you think, wow, you know, maybe we are being visited, or you know, 
Did you think about it? I did. I thought a lot about it. It really, like I said, it altered my consciousness. It made me start to think. I started to think, of who the heck was he? And who are they? And what are they doing? And why are they doing that? And yeah. were they showing off? I mean, that was our first reaction. Were these guys showing off? <laughs> Look what we can yeah. do. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I, I don't know, because, you know, I kept thinking, if they had kept going straight, if only they had kept going straight, we would have forgotten all about it. We would have thought, yeah, so somebody's aircraft, they just kept going, you know, unusual aircraft, whatever, whatever. Yeah. It was. And we would have forgotten about it. But that maneuver, that 90 degree turn, and then just taking off like that, the, the way they did, that's what was indelible in my mind. And, and that kind of like, what the hell was that? Because yeah. <laughs> We all, just, like I said, we all just looked at each other like, did you just see what I just saw? Did, or, am I dreaming? And, you know, it was kind of like, holy mackerel, that's, that's, that was, star it was startling. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It's very uh, unusual. I mean, we were used to seeing jets. We were used to seeing other ships. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, something that outdoes us uh, kind of made you feel like, yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> Right. And whoever that is, I like the like the off the op, and This was the operations officer. Okay, this is a full lieutenant. In other words, in the army, he would be a captain. And this was a straight kind of arrow kind of guy. This is the kind of guy most officers on the ship. You saluted him in the morning, and that was it. You were done saluting for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. This officer, you had to salute every time you saw him. He was in Annapolis. I believe he was an Annapolis guy. Yeah, and you're serious. Yeah. Very serious. His demeanor changed after that. He was not as serious anymore. He started to uh, smile a little more. Huh. I can tell you his name. I can even show you a picture of the officer, but I, I don't think I, I, I should because uh, I don't have permission from that, uh, that uh, gentleman to be showing this photograph. Right, right. Um, so this question, this is a, another speculation. Could the V craft have been one solid craft? Most, most most likely if it turned in an instant, right? And the 90 degree angle, then the V formation never changed, right? Right, never. Yeah. They, and, went, they were like this and they weren't like that. Right. Boom. And I mean, not that slow. <laughs> yeah. They were, boom, boom. They were, they were gone. I mean. Were, were you a, an, It was almost like an elongation slightly. Like when they took off, it was like a like, like a, a streak, blur. like a blur, yeah, like a yeah. blur. And they were gone. Then they were, all the lights were gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that really that's really a good one. How far offshore were you at that point? No, we were in the, we were in the middle of the ocean. We were traveling from Midway Island to Guam. We were in a part of the ocean where the charts are white because there's no land. So yeah. we had. In fact, we were marking uh, rocks. We were working with sonar at the time, marking uh, rocks. In other words, we we're navigating and actually creating things for the charts. Um, you know, things that are there. You know, oh, there's a rock was we'll sighted here in 1953. Uh, so, so, you know, things like that would be on the chart. And so we were documenting uh, uh, new things through a so we could send it to the Notice to Mariners. The Notice to Mariners is the international um, document that goes out to all ships at sea. Uh, say a buoy's been moved 50 yards this way. Okay, so they send out a Notice to Mariners. Buoy so-and-so has been moved this way or that way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always indicating any kind of uh, 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 change in, in um, navigational markers or anything like that. So that was our job was always keep our charts up to date. So we were always looking at notice to mariners and correcting our charts all the time. We were correcting charts. That was our daily job, correcting charts, mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. sure we were up to date. Right. Uh, Bill, uh, that the KGRA radio uh, producer sent me a question for you. Uh, wanted to know what you thought about the military coming for, not just pilots, but people like himself who observed, um, things on naval vessels well it's about time i think yeah. there's probably a, a lot more out there and what i'm hoping with this podcast is that some of the witnesses that were on the destroyer when i was on the destroyer who saw the v formation will start to acknowledge i mean 
you know, there was quite a few witnesses, you know. I, I mean, it was a, two, de definitely two officers, uh, 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 a full lieutenant and a uh, ensign, uh, mm -hmm. one of the officers, junior officers of the deck. So I yeah. know they all saw the same thing I saw. Yeah. So I am hoping maybe one of them will remember it or remember the ball. I, I did ask one of the other navigators if they remember the ball incident, and he couldn't remember it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, how, you know, if if we if that's like selective thinking or or you know, I don't know. I really don't yeah. know. I, I really thought that you know people would remember us turning the ship off because that is one of the yeah. eeriest feeling to have when you're middle of the uh, middle of the water and all of a sudden there's nothing. You have no engine. You're used to the the ship sounds all the time. You know, the engines are going. Right. You're used to a certain hum in the ship. And all of a sudden right. there's a hum, and all you hear is the water lapping on the side of the water, on the side of the ship. You kind of like really feel eerie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's also, well, you're, uh, you're not under yeah. power. <laughs> you know, I've heard of, of people that have had, you know, actual UFO encounters, and the people that they witnessed with said they don't remember, which is pretty bizarre. You know, uh, you, well, it, it makes me wonder if they were in shock to yeah. the point that they just push that out of their mind. They don't want to. They don't want to remember it because it, it it is kind of a scary thing. I mean, you know, we were kind of a little. I was a little freaked out about it when you say, you know, you just saw something. They make a ninety degree turn and disappears. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, that's unusual. I, yeah. I have seen other things like that where I'll be looking. I, I'm a, I, I tell people I'm a junior astronomer. I became a junior astronomer. I have a couple of telescopes already. Uh, and uh, my binoc I have my standard 7 by 50 binoculars <laughs> <laughs> that I still use. And I, I have so often will be looking at the sky and I'll see something like a star. And I'll wonder, wow, what star is that? I don't, I don't remember that star being there. And all of a sudden, it'll just go out. It'll be like stationary light, and then all of a sudden it just goes out. And I go, okay, that's not a satellite. I know what satellites look like. Satellites keep moving in one direction. They don't They don't maneuver. Satellites do not maneuver. <laughs> they don't change yeah. properly. They keep yeah. in a steady, and they're, they're in orbit. <laughs> yeah. So, no, so. I've heard, of, I've had a few people tell me that they've seen satellites, and then all of a sudden they'll move, jag off um, in one direction. So sometimes there's an atmospheric issues that can make you know the, the lights change colors and blink and things like that you know. the earth earth too as a satellite you know goes to the other side of the earth kind of thing they'll, they'll go out you know so you, oh yeah yeah that's all sun reflected yeah, yeah. the sun even though that we don't see the sun it's on the reflection is still um still up, happening, yeah. from the sun up there and and uh space junk too now i've Never seen any space junk, but I've heard people talk about it. And oh, yeah. um, one one friend told me um, a story about being on the C C five or CE five, whatever it is, has to do with uh, Stephen Greer's uh, famous groups that he gets together and to see UFOs. And they were they the person believed they were actually seeing space junk. All the UFOs were just space junk, which also supposedly reflects from the sun. Until it gets out of range of the the sunbeam, but but if it's space junk, then it usually will be going in one direction. It won't be unless it's falling. You know, falling space, yeah. space junk. Yeah, and like you I know, said, I've never I've a, seen a lot of satellites, but I've never seen what's that? I'm sorry, uh, space junk doesn't maneuver. <laughs> not that we know of. Not not not. It's not supposed to. Uh, let's see. Um. Well, someone was asking, have you ever had any other types of experiences? Whoops, you there? Uh-oh, looks like uh looks like Alfred has frozen. I'm not really sure what happened. Um, let me take them out, bring them back in. All right. So I think we lost our guest here for a moment. Um, I'm gonna try to see if he'll come back in, but I right now I have to remove him. And uh, Bill, I'm wondering if you can hear me here, if you can uh, come on the show for a couple of minutes and and uh, let me see if I can. Let's see. Uh, I don't know how to do that. So hopefully he'll be coming back in. Uh, oh, he's gone. Uh, 
Bill, are you able to talk a little bit, chat a little bit? Oh, okay. All right. I found him, I find him fascinating. And just from my perspective, I believe him to be 100% authentic, Martin. Yeah. Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't be. You're right. I mean, the you can body language says a lot about a person, not just their vocal, you know, speaking. Yeah. But yeah. you you can tell, I mean, he's very passionate about what he's discussing. And then when he went back, um, and you you kind of changed uh, the perspective of the question, kind of, he still reiterated the same thing he said earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know Interesting, oh. really interesting cases he was talking about. Right. And I wish that people would come forward. It's too bad that those people that were on the ship with him, um, I don't know if they're still alive, you know, if they're still in service. Maybe that's a reason why they're not coming forward. Because they're still active duty. I don't know. They, they, they would be rather quite up there in age, but um, this is the Vietnam War era. Right. But right. I, I think it's important that people like himself come forward. So maybe that would encourage others to come forward as well. That's right. That's right. Bill, Bill, I'm hearing feedback coming through your speakers when coming back through your mic. I just had to mute you when I'm, when I'm talking. So I think your, your speakers uh, are a little bit loud there or something. So I'm just going to, you're using a headset. I don't know why I'm hearing the feedback. Um, wow. Anyway, here's a, we're hoping that Alfred comes back on. It appeared that his internet did go out. And there's a uh, a question here, Martin. Did your sighting change direction? Yes, <laughs> um, it did. But it happened the uh, UFO sighting I had. Uh, Bill, I'm going to have to mute you. I don't know why, but the UFO sighting that I had in uh, Carmel Valley, we just drove through there the other day, um, was just a craft that went over in one direction and stopped and just stayed. You know, for me at this point trying to remember exactly how long it stayed stationary. I'm going to say five seconds, maybe. And then it went off on a, a, a very straight angle toward Monterey from, uh, from the direction I was in. So, yeah, I mean, it changed directions, but it was going very slow the whole time. And I, I can't judge the height of it. So I can't figure out exactly um, how, how far it was. Anyway. Now now, do I still have that echo? Because I kind of changed some settings on my background. Yeah. No, we're all set now. Thank you. Okay. Now, what I saw over my house, and I apologize to folks that are watching. I've had oral surgery, so it's a little tough for me to have a conversation right now. That's why Martin mentioned that before he brought me on. But um, what, when I captured that over my house, it curved down, curved back up, curved a little to the right, stopped, whew, gone. I think that was swamp gas. <laughs> Should be. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I will never say it's extraterrestrial or yeah. interdimensional because it's unclear. It was way up there. There's no way to discern what the object was. And it could be a drone because you mentioned something. Remember he mentioned about satellites being stationary? Yeah. Or going in an orbit. Yeah, geosynchronous yeah. whatever right now we know that under development by the world powers let's just say with the controlled hypersonic missiles that are going on where they can actually control the traje trajectory of this projectile or whatever the platform they're using i would not be surprised there's uh, drones that they're using in, in space also satellites can move there are killer satellites out there, Martin, that they can actually connect and throw off other satellites. You can look it up. They're called killer satellites. Um, they can move toward another satellite to take it out. So just because we think that maybe, you know, a satellite goes in an orbit, there, trust me, you know they're doing all kinds of stuff up there that the public isn't aware of. That, that very well, that's kind of scary. It is, but I'm just saying you have to think about all the possibilities. My, and I, I think a lot of people that are watching right now would say we need to deal with all the possible rational explanations before coming to a conclusion where now we've eliminated all those possibilities. Now, what is it? 
Right. We don't know. And that's the things that need to be investigated. But with all the stuff that all these countries are testing right now, um, I mean, I'm just a person that believes a lot of the stuff that we see uh, is natural phenomenon, uh, man-made phenomenon. Right. Um, and man-made in top secret experimental level um, craft. That's just my opinion. Yeah. But I'm sure there's a small percentage that fits under that category of unexplainable. That's right. Um, well, while we're at this juncture, I'm just going to say, too, uh, I'm not getting an email email or any correspondence from from um, our guest. I'm not sure if he's coming back on or if he's just, you know, his Internet's gone. Who knows? I had a situation where someone was on years ago and um, the, I think their house got struck by lightning or something. Wow. And, and they were they were uh, gone. That was definitely a government plan, I'm sure. You know? Well, he was I'll tell you one thing. He is a fascinating guest. I agree with Pamela in chat. And I told you privately in chat, I find this discussion fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I've always liked, and, and, um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, I have uh, some recordings already of people that had a UFO encounter. I like to run these during the, the breaks. If you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to email me and tell me about your UFO encounter, if I think we can do, a clip about it. I will do that. And my email address is martin at podcastufo.com. So also, I got to say, um, the guests that I was supposed to have uh, for this coming next week, uh, I have not heard back from. So if you are curious what our guest is going to be each week, then all you have to do is go to podcastufo.com, go over to the sidebar and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. And uh, then each week you'll get a, a link to the blog and a link to the guest information. Um, so I'm not sure, Bill, if our guest is coming back or not. Well, if anybody, I mean, if you would like to call in, I can jump off and take your calls. If you have calls for Martin, hopefully. Um, yeah, we can try. We can try. try. His guest will come back. And if his guest comes back, you can ask questions. Whoops. Sorry about that, Bill. That's all right. I'm just hearing some echoing again. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put up, here's the phone number for anyone who would like to call in. Um, that number is uh, 855-472-5483. If you want to call in now and talk about oh, basically anything, the direction that the UFO topic seems to be headed in. Um, some people want to talk about disclosure. I have mixed feelings about that, that actual word. Uh, I'm not really sure. Wait, um, now, now that you say that, wasn't tonight, the night that they had something at the National Press Club? Yes, that's correct. Um, Bill Sal uh, Bob Salas, who was on the show a while back. It is tonight. I was trying to find out more information about that just before we went on the air. And it's supposed to be, he's back in, is it, where was the National Press I'm, Club? Washington, D.C.? Yes, I actually may have a link to the live YouTube stream. Oh, Peter hey, Robbins. Right. Yeah, I'm going to send it to you this way. I'll put it in the private chat. But, um, Peter Robbins is the only person there that is technically in the field of, of ufology. Yeah. Uh -huh. But he sent me a link, and I'll, I'll try to pull it up while we're on the air, and then you could share it to that stream. So yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would find that fascinating um, exactly. to watch. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll look it up, I think... I may have it. Here it is. So I, I'm going to click on the link myself so I can grab it. And I'm going to mute so we don't hear it on the air. Oh, my God. Someone says they think I'm on the wacky weed. Isn't that funny? <laughs> well, you know, maybe that would help. I might try that uh, next time. But thank you for that, Larry. All right. There is the link. All right. It It, it was this morning, actually, Martin. Okay. But you can go there and watch it, folks. All right. Um, I will. Um, let's see. How how can I do You want that? me to send it to you on Skype? This way you can. No, no, that's fine. I have okay. a, I have an idea what to do. But I, Okay. Um, but it was from 8.30 to 11 this morning. So it's two and a half hours. And oh, we do. Well, yeah, we do have a caller. So you can take me off. So I do have a caller. Yes. So right. jump, get me off so I can answer the phone. 
<laughs> All right, Have I'll a great night, everybody. All right, but I got to bring you back in when the caller. Yeah, I'll take myself off camera. All right. All right, so Bill is taking a call. We have a caller into the show. Uh, thank you for our patience. I only, can only guess that somehow um, our guest tonight lost his internet. That's unfortunate. Um, it was a great conversation. I'll keep my eyes op open to see if he comes back. Um, and hopefully he will come back. But right now we have uh, someone, Bill is taking, screening the call right now. And if you'd like to call in, um, that number again, right up on the screen, 855-472-5483. Was it Harry or Larry that said he thought I was on the wacky weed? But anyway, um, hopefully it was Larry. And we have Harry from Louisiana. Welcome to the show. You're live. Call in um, that number again, right up on the screen, All right. All right. Uh, this is what's going to have to happen, uh, Harry. You're going to have to mute your show. You're watching the show live, obviously. Uh, so, Harry, mute mute the show, please. Mute the show. And, uh, Bill, hopefully you can remember to tell people to do that. We got a couple of calls. But right now we have uh, – Harry, you there? I am, yes. Hi. Welcome to the show. You have a question or you want to talk about a, a topic? I was uh, interested in the uh, triangle UFOs that forced the witnesses to the ground. Uh, I hadn't heard that uh, before, and I'm interested in uh, knowing more about that. I... Yeah. Well, I would um, now, uh, Katie uh, in in Australia is the person I know. Now, it was a triangle for her. I couldn't get the fact that when he said this black object this was during the Vietnam War back in 1966 when it flew over the people on the ground, it forced them to the ground. Um, and that's something um, he didn't really say, you know, hopefully he'll come back on, but he didn't really say the shape of that, that craft. However, Katie, uh, who will be on the show at some point, is going to go into detail about what she saw over them. So, yeah, that, that is a fascinating story. It is interesting. I just went out online and, a few minutes ago and was just looking at triangle UFO um, stories, trying to see something, uh, anything I could find about that. I just thought that was an interesting kind of phenomenon uh, associated with that. Um, I'm just, you know, just, it makes you speculate about what could be, what, what, you know, what kind of uh, propulsion system or whatever could be producing that, that effect, but that's really fascinating. Um, it almost seems like uh, an anti-gravity or something like that. Well, yeah, that's kind of what I thought, but I, I don't know that uh, effect uh, in other reports. I mean, I'm, it, I may have heard it and just forgot, but it doesn't seem to be too common. And there have been a lot of UFO reports over the uh, many decades. Um, that would be interesting to like do a search of, of sightings or close up encounters that where people were physically, um, affected and maybe forced even to to the ground by it that's uh, yeah yeah so yeah that's only the second time that i've ever heard that and so yeah i think that that is uh that is fascinating and uh so uh, i'm just hearing from my guests now just to let everyone know uh i did hear back it's dr irena scott she's going to be on next week on next week's show so uh, have you ever um Harry, have you ever look, looked into Dave Marler's great book on triangle UFOs? I haven't looked in, in into the, I haven't seen the book. I was, uh, I think, aware that there was a book. Uh, in fact, just just now out online, I, I noticed uh, uh, some mention of that, I think. So, uh, yeah, maybe I need to check that out and see. It's it's wonderful there. research. Now, I, I talk to Dave quite often, but that's something I've never remembered to ask him about about the pressure effect if any of these ufo triangle ufos i have his book i mean i could <laughs> i suppose i could uh, i have i have a lot of books uh to read through but that's one of them that you know from the part that i did read i haven't i've read part of it it's so well written and documented and and uh great stuff uh you don't hear a lot of triangle ufos early on um but there are some there are some encounters that go 
back, but just uh, there's just very few of them. It seems like it's the vehicle of choice these days. I mean, it seems like there's a lot more uh, triangles than than others. But uh, we're stacked up. We actually have uh, two more people waiting in line. Uh, anything else, Terry? Okay. Well, just very quickly, I've for a long time I've been wanting to see a panel convened uh, to discuss uh, whether or not uh, you know the government might have actually acquired technology over the decades that would allow them to have uh, anti-gravity uh, craft. Um, I, uh, you know, all the money that goes into black projects, they must have explored that. And I'd, I'd love to see a panel of like physicists and aerospace people just speculate. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that I know of in the private sector that that indicates that we that that humanity has has the that that ability right now. Not in the private sector. I would just wonder if if um, Experts could speculate about whether the government might have focused enough money to have actually produced that kind of thing, because that that would be technology that would maybe explain a lot of these things away as as ours and not from somewhere else. Um, I can understand though if, if they are trying to keep it secret, because I mean it would be such a you know it would be such a step ahead of everyone else if we actually had something like that i mean and also you can think of all the uses we could have if we actually had that type of thing available to us uh the energy that well i don't know what type of energy it would takes to create the uh you know the innate gravity if it's not a lot of energy perhaps travel could be completely revolutionary you know in the future so but anyway we've got four people now online yes. waiting to talk thank you. So, thank you i enjoyed talking to you all right all right, Harry, take care. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next, uh, we have William from Florida. William, you're live on the air. Hi, Martin. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to install a security system, you know, cameras and DVR at my house. And next to it, I put a few cameras on the roof and aimed them straight up. <laughs> um, what I use are wide spectrum cameras. Cameras that could see more than just visible light. They could be infrared and ultraviolet. Um, can I just ask you something? Can I just ask you something? Sure. Are you on speakerphone? Uh, no, I'm not. Let me Let me check. Okay. Just no, I have right. a bad connection. Uh, well, it was fading in and out, so I wonder if you just make sure you can speak into the mouthpiece and continue on, if you would. Okay. Let me go to a different part of the house. In a brick house, so it's reception's a little spotty. Yeah. Okay. So you hear me now? Yeah, but it is fading in and out, so uh, go ahead, though. Okay. Um, so what I noticed was um, the DVR has a, um, a recording log and it puts a watermark on a 24 hour type of display so you can see whatever motion sensed by any of the cameras. And what I was noticing occasionally, this would happen maybe once a week or so, but every Sunday I'd sit down and sip my coffee and look at, look at what, you know, what went through the yard or went well over the house. And uh, many times it was helicopters and planes. And, um, and so I was seeing these balls of light going across the sky occasionally. Um, some were closer, some were further up. Some I saw in a V pattern, like you were talking about earlier with the guy from uh, the Vietnam. More. Yep. And, um, yeah, and so very amazing. So what I ended up doing was I took a satellite dish and hacked it out. I put a uh, high-gain microphone in it instead and aimed it straight up also. Hmm. And when I had it hooked to the stereo, I could really crank it up. And uh, these balls of light would never make any noise, mm -hmm. completely silent. The um, planes and... You know, helicopters, of course, made noise. I, I could even hear the jetliners that looked like a speck in the sky going over. 
and it was it was good security for the house because I could hear everything in the neighborhood as well because it would pick up anything that was reflected around the neighborhood audio leaf. Um, but yeah, and so on occasions, I had some of these ball, balls of light that were so close to the yard that you could actually see the heat trail coming off of them. And the heat is displayed at night. The image, it, it makes the image white hmm. uh, on this type of wide spectrum camera. But um, on this ones that were close, I could actually see a heat trail behind it, almost looking like, you know, uh, a mane of, of white hair, you know, with the wind blowing. And, and you could see this ball just slowly moving across over the house. And, uh, and so my camera system, my DVR, was picking this stuff up and putting a watermark on my recorder. So what I'm basically trying to tell everybody is anybody can do this. Yeah. They're there all the time. It's just a matter of looking in the right spectrums. Usually they're not able to be seen with the naked eye, and, and that's why some people can see them and other people can't. Oh, that's interesting. One of the things I was going to ask you, but you kind of answered the, the question, was that if uh, is there an airport nearby and could these be landing lights? But you said you didn't. You can hear things from the airliners going overhead. Nothing from these, but did these things travel in the same, uh, the same direction every time? No, no, not at all. All different directions. Some I actually saw coming straight down out of the sky, and they appeared to like enlarge as they got closer, and mm. then they would go back up. Really, that uh, is some bizarre. Would go across the sky horizontally. Others would be vertical. So are you saying this is not in, it's not in the visible spectrum? Many times they're not. Hmm. Now, and I have seen a few on occasion uh, with my own eyes, but I don't think that all of these that were going across the sky could be seen by the general public because I'm certain that, that I would have heard about it from neighbors and other people. I even had friends that would call me occasionally and say, hey, you know, there's something coming in your direction. And uh, I was never able to to catch what they saw or if they saw something the night before, I would go back in the on the DVR, you know, and look at it from the night before play playing it back. So I I try to confirm what people saw, but never, never was able to catch, you know, the, the same direction. So my, my cameras were probably zoomed into about maybe uh, 10 time magnification. Uh, so I wasn't really heavily zoomed to, to see something close up. But, but yet when you, when you do that, then you lose your field of view mm -hmm. and, and you don't see as much. And right. so I ended up with probably two dozen um, occurrences that I ended up saving. And uh, it was always, you know, great entertainment for friends that would come over or, or family. We would sit there and, and play this stuff back. And and uh, everybody was just, you know, dumbed down and nobody knew what to really say. Well, I'm wondering if this is, if you would be able to send me one of those videos, if you'd be willing to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be willing to do that. You, because you got um, what, there's there's people I'm sure that are interested that are listening to this right now. If I would have your permission to just put it up uh, on on YouTube with a unlisted, and then put the link to it in the show notes, so people that are listening to the show only can uh, take a peek at it. Right, right, right. Well, let's can we talk uh, later after the call? We'll talk later after, and what you need to do, if you would. Um, cause I have uh, things going on this evening. It's early here in California where I am, but I need you to email me at podcast, martin at podcast ufo.com. But William, thank you so much for the call. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. And that was martin at what? Podcast ufo.com. Got it. Thanks. Martin. All right. Okay. William, thank you. All right. Next we have Stephen calling from Michigan. Stephen, welcome to the show. 
Stephen, are you there? Welcome to the show. Um, all right. So let's jump over to Chris from Houston. Chris, are you there? Welcome to the show. Hey, Martin. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on. I've called him three times now, I think, and each time it's been a pleasure. So thank you for having me. I had two questions. Um, I just finished watching the Skinwalker Ranch documentary by Jeremy Corbell and with the NIDS guys out on the ranch. Okay. That's what I thought. I was like, I'll go, I'll roll with it. Thank you. Okay. What's going on? All right. Uh, am I missing something here? I didn't quite catch that. Martin, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. I think we got the names mixed up on the call, but I can go ahead with my question. Uh, all right. What's your name? It's Steve from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Oh yes, I did. I did try you, and uh, I guess you weren't uh, connected at the time. Steve, uh, uh, welcome to the show. So anyway, move. Uh, we can move right along here. Tell tell me what it is <laughs> that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So I I just uh, finished watching the Skinwalker Ranch documentary by Jeremy Corbell, and yes. it was interesting. You know, with the PhD scientist guys there for over twenty years, they kept talking about how the phenomenon they were trying to capture almost knew exactly where like camera positions would be. It would always pop off just like right off of the camera frame. So you could never capture it and you could never see it. And it was interesting. They always said that it was, it did not want itself to be revealed. So, you know, I watched the New York times come out with these, these videos from uh, the, the, the feds and they're, I think they're amazing, but clearly they're not, it's not that, that golden image that can convince the world, you know, of, of the reality right. of the phenomenon. And we've never had an image like that. So I wanted you to maybe comment and speculate on, you know, if we ever will get a chance to see that or if you just, spe I guess, speculating against or about like when they appear and when they allow themselves to be viewed and if we'll ever see the full extent. And last quick question, Martin, is when I go to YouTube and you're, you're looking for UFO videos, I, I swear the algorithms, they don't, they give you news stories. They don't, I know there's more videos and images out there. And I'm wondering if you have any uh, ideas or thoughts on other platforms or easier ways to access the massive amount of media that I know is out there and, and just feel that it's being suppressed. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you asked a number of questions there, but uh, get as far as the YouTube goes, I I'm, I'm not you know, there's some really good channels out there. I actually think that Chris Lito is doing a very good job, but he's doing it mostly on, you know, his experience and military experience. John Greenwald has a great YouTube channel, um, The Black Vault, um, and there are a number of them. We have a um, the UFO, uh, the Celebrity Review, uh, Louis Yemez, um, a fun guy. He is he's got a great show. He's trying to do some really good work. So yeah, it's hard as far as searching searching a word. You know, word search is very difficult because you're going to come across all kinds of you know, bogus things and things like that. Um, so it, it's tough. You got to choose your sources carefully when you're looking into this topic. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the call. Sorry, couldn't answer it all. I'm trying to get some people in here. And next is uh, actually a friend, a uh, friend of the show as well, Linda Zimmerman. Linda, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Martin. How are you? Great. I'm so glad you called in. How are you? Uh, good. I, I, it, you piqued my curiosity when you were mentioning the pressure from a UFO. Yeah, I have heard that uh, with several witnesses, but the earliest case I've been able to find was actually Oak Park, Illinois, in 1929. <laughs> um, a fascinating case. A medical student was walking home, and a 40-foot glowing disc. Uh, descended to about a hundred foot altitude. He felt heat, and the pressure was so strong it literally knocked him to his knees. And when it took off, he was able to stand up, and he said the distinct odor of sulfur was in the air. So, uh, thought you might be interested in this case. Definitely, isn't that something that I never heard of? I don't know if I've ever heard of any encounter ever that there was like a sulfur smell. That's pretty bizarre. 
very rare. Yeah, yeah. And the pressure thing, I mean, we can only speculate, but it makes me wonder what was the effect on other biological things in the area? Like, you know, I mean, trees, plants, um, dogs, uh, you know, was it, I, I mean, is there any accounting of that? I mean, though, I'm, I'm, I'm sure when you're going all the way back to that 1929, uh, I think that's what you said. Uh, that's, right. The details are probably not in there like that. Not the and plus he was walking on uh, Euclid Street uh, in Oak Park, which probably was more urban, I think. Hmm. Um, but yeah, there should have been trees, but he didn't. He didn't say anything about about that. But uh, mm -hmm. to me, it sounds like there's there's some sort of field this craft is generating. Perhaps it has to do with propulsion, or you know, creating some sort of field in front of the craft to to push someone to the ground. That has to be very strong. I would think so. And it also makes me wonder if there was a sound issue, like a lot of people say that sound, you know, disappears and, uh, you know. He initially heard humming like turbines, he uh -huh. said. Um, didn't mention any, any silence uh, after that. But, uh, you know, between the pressure, the heat, the sulfur smell, this, this is... Um, this was a remarkable case. Definitely. Definitely. Linda, thank you so much for the call. It's always, always great to talk to you and always nice to see you when that happens. So thank you. Yes. Gl glad to uh, share that. So take care. All right. All right you too. Bye-bye. Bye now. Uh, we have just one more call. We only got a few minutes. Uh, Chris, uh, waiting patiently in Houston, Texas. Chris, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, Martin. Hi, Hi Bill. Yeah, uh, thanks I'm, for thanks for being on hold all that time. Sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. Um, I'm I'm not calling with a personal sighting this time. Um, I'm calling uh, to uh, just mention a note about the uh, the light uh, question that keeps coming up. Why use um, um, uh, navigation lights on a um, aircraft? Yeah. Uh, if you if you're not there's nothing you don't want people to see you. Well, I think you one thing that, that keeps every time I hear this I this occurs to me uh, that if why do we use lights on our aircraft it's not for aliens to see us it's for other humans to see us it's yeah. for people on the ground to see us and specifically for other people in the air to see us so doesn't it make perfectly good common sense that if you are a biological organism with optical visual systems that um, operate in sh uh, what we share, which is the visible light spectrum, that if you have other craft in the area, that you would be running lights to uh, for not for anybody on the ground, not for any of the observers or witnesses, but for your other team members who are also in the air with you or on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a little bit, it could be a little bit of a, you know, scary thought, but it does make sense, doesn't it? That if if you're if you're a, uh, if you have aircraft that are that are aircraft spacecraft, and you operate in a visual light spectrum, then you it makes sense to put lights on your aircraft, whether you're human, non-human, wherever you're from. I mean, yeah. And uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid, though, Chris, we're out of use lights. We're, we're out of time, Chris. I hate to say it. But um, yeah, that is, it, it's quite hard, you know, and it's also hard not to think in human terms, but you did just mention, you know, maybe whoever they are uh, needs the same thing. And that's a possibility. I, I, I don't really know, but I, I appreciate your, your thoughts on that. That was uh, very good. Thanks I mean, a lot. Creatures at the bottom of the ocean use lights for each good other, point. not for us. Good, good point. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. All right. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for hanging in with us. It's too bad we lost our guest, but um, I do want to thank all the callers that called in and helped us go through the show. I want to also thank Bill uh, for helping out. And next week, uh, we just found out we have Dr. Irina Scott. Should be a great show. Thanks so much, everyone. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Mm -hmm.